Our subject today is James F. Sermons. So please, don't leave your seats. This kind of presentation usually opens with a baby picture of the subject, but this is as close as we could get. Jim Sermons burned all his baby pictures, and he put out contracts on everyone who tried to help us find one. So we'll just have to accept Jim the way he is. Or was. This is a rare, I mean really rare, family portrait from the early 1960s. In the back row, from left to right, are Jim's son John, his daughter Donna, and his son Jim. In the front row are Jim's son Tom, Jim himself, and his wife Virginia. Mr. Sermon's ascent up the CBS corporate ladder was relentless, and after a series of dreary promotions, he seized the opportunity to spend most of his life sitting with union members and their associates across a table, sharing succulent lunches and dinners at someone else's expense, while reclining in comfortable chairs and bantering with union and corporate representatives throughout the night. You got the picture. Forget it. Only some of this is true. Here's the real story. Jim Sermons began his career as a writer announcer at Cincinnati radio station WCKY. Having heard his college radio work, the station wanted him to host their morning show. He took the job, and two years later, in 1942, he went to work for CBS as a production supervisor. That was the first of many moves at CBS. In 1957, he moved to CBS Labor Relations, where he was promoted five different times, and in 1994, he was finally named Executive Vice President of Industrial Relations. Despite his tendency toward upward mobility, Mr. Sermons also liked to hang around a while. He didn't retire from CBS until 2000, and his 58-year tenure at the network is longer than all but two others in the entire history of CBS. You don't spend 58 years at an organization without trying your hand at many different things. One of Jim Sermon's side duties at CBS was to pose for ads for the network's makeup department. And here's Jim attempting to become a CBS cameraman. Unfortunately, just as he was about to take on his new profession, CBS switched to digital cameras. Flummoxed by the new technology, Jim returned to the simpler tasks of labor relations. After Jim was asked to take over CBS talent contract negotiations, he spent the next three decades or so negotiating and administering contracts with AFTRA, SAG, the Directors Guild and Writers Guild, and the American Federation of Musicians. He negotiated many of the most important contracts in the entertainment industry, and he was responsible for over 200 labor agreements in broadcasting, each of which had to be renegotiated every few years. He negotiated 61 contracts with AFTRA, during which time four after chief executives and seven national presidents resigned from office rather than face the prospect of new negotiations with Mr. Sermons. Believe it or not, some people actually loved Jim, and still do. Here's what Larry King has to say about him. When I was 21 years old, I took an outstanding education course in broadcasting, which was my life's dream. The course was brilliantly taught by one James Sermons. A few months later, I bumped into Mr. Sermons on a street in New York. I asked him, if I want to break into broadcasting, where should I go? What should I do? This dapper, handsome gentleman with a great voice said, try Miami. People there are either on the way up or on the way out. I tried Miami, and the rest, let's say, is history. I will be forever indebted to Jim, whom I often think about. What if, what if I hadn't met him that day? Congratulations, James on an extraordinary career. Maybe we'll meet again someday and I'll give you some advice. The first years of this extraordinary career were during World War II and on June 6, 1944, Jimmy Sermons, as his boss called him, was an important link in CBS radio news coverage of D-Day. At 3.32 a.m. at CBS Network Operations in New York, Jimmy got the word. He checked the control room confirmed that all 143 CBS stations were standing by and listened as Senior Public Relations Officer Colonel R. Ernest Dupuy told the world, under the command, command of General, of Eisenhower, General Eisenhower, Eisenhower, Allied Naval Forces, supported by strong air forces, began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. This picture from 1946 shows Jim at left during his production supervisor days at CBS News. That's Edward R. Murrow in the middle, 
and Ted Church, CBS News Director at Wright. Murrow launched Walter Cronkite's CBS career, and Cronkite and Jim Sermons became close friends. This picture was taken in 1967. Just a year later, Jim would become a trustee of the AFTRA Health and Retirement Funds, then called Pension and Welfare. This was obviously the crowning achievement in an otherwise lackluster career. Jim also served several terms as a member of the executive board of the American Arbitration Association. He finally resigned when it became clear that nobody wanted to arbitrate anything anymore. This is the entrance to the posh James F. Sermons Conference Room, located on the seventh floor of the Madison Avenue offices of After H&R. This room commands a breathtaking view of 38th Street. Top secret conferences are held here, but if the room is already occupied, they're held in the hallway instead. At a reception celebrating Jim's 50th anniversary with CBS, network president Howard Stringer and Dan Rather awarded Jim the S for sermons, which had been mounted on the old CBS Broadcasting Building. Another award presented to Jim is this original RCA Ribbon V Velocity Microphone mounted on a plaque. This mic was probably used by Edward R. Murrow, Douglas Edwards, Walter Cronkite, and most of the other radio and TV news broadcasters from the 1930s to the 1950s. Jim's fellow H&R trustees shared some information about his 42 years of service to the board. Jim was elected chair of the employer trustees on January 11, 1972. Re-elected annually, he remained employer chair through December 31, 2003, a period of 32 years. Jim worked closely with trustees representing both AFTRA and the industry, helping to create and maintain collegial and effective working relationships between the trustees and between trustees and AFTRA H&R staff. One shared goal was expanding the flow of information to and from the participants. Jim will be the first to tell you that he alone is not responsible for all of the fund's achievements during his many years of service but his colleagues insist that Jim certainly didn't stand on the sidelines as retirement benefits were increased ten times during the 1990s. He wasn't an innocent bystander when the health plans were created. He wasn't in the locker room when the wellness program or coverage of same-sex partners came to pass. Jim was also very involved in establishing the industry substance abuse program many years ago, a program which later became a part of the AFTRA health plan. Of course, Jim didn't accomplish these and many other good things all by himself, but working with his industry and AFTRA colleagues, Jim was an indispensable architect in building a consensus that made good things possible. During negotiations, Jim always weighed his words with great care. A former negotiator, who over the course of many years represented several organizations in negotiations with Jim, still marvels at his memory. He knew every period and every comma and every contract he ever negotiated, he recalls. He was a tough negotiator, but a wonderful man. Jim Sermons is also a very private person. He doesn't talk much about himself. If you had to depend on Jim to discuss his achievements or to persuade other folks to brag about him, you would think that Jim Sermons had never done anything at all. He is a very retiring man. But we want Jim to know that he cannot really retire from any of us. We simply wouldn't accept it, and that is something we are not willing to negotiate.